Monster Professor. Welcome to the Monster Professor, a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. I'm your host, Josh Woods, author, editor, professor, and monster expert. And the show's been on a brief hiatus, uh, but it's good to be back. And 2021 has some cool things in store for the show and various related projects, I think. Um, If you're new to the show, you can check out um, any of my books or any of my other projects at my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. I only had to sneak that word author into the website website address because there are many other cool Josh Woodses such as pro wrestlers and tattoo artists and and I'm the nerdy bookish kind um so you can check out my book Black Palace or my book of short stories Oh Monstrous World or just other projects I have going on uh essays and maybe even some secret projects popping up soon through that website and Today's guest is a real honor and a real treat and a real delight for me. Um, I get to speak with Dana Joya. Now, if you're in the poetry slash literary world, he needs no introduction. Um, And otherwise, our cool subject for this episode, Nosferatu, needs no introduction for you. But just to sort it all out for those who need a little bit more background on Dana Joya, you might know him as a poet. And if you know him as a poet, you know he has five full-length collections of verse, and one of which, Interrogations at Noon, won the American Book Award. You might also know him as California State Poet Laureate from 2015 to 2019. Um, He's a renowned student of Elizabeth Bishop. His memoir on studying with her, studying with Miss Bishop, is just came out actually. Um, so that's another thing he does is write all sorts of books. We'll get into those in a second. But the link to uh, where you can order and uh, buy that book will be in the description, along with links to his website and other works. Let's say you might know him as literary critic. That might be true. Or essayist or editor. Four books uh, of essays, including the one that maybe we could say is controversial or started a debate, at least in America, Can Poetry Matter? Uh, That ended up being a finalist for a National Book Critics Circle Award. He edited or co-edited 24 best, at least 24, perhaps more by now, best-selling literary anthologies, including an introduction to literature he did with X.J. Kennedy, also another amazing poet, by the way. And that's a textbook that many of us are using in colleges and universities around the world, including me. I've been using it for over a decade in my classes, one of the best college textbooks Uh, that money can buy that's actually out there Um, you might know him as the editor of best american poetry 2018 Um, his essays and memoirs shown up in new yorker atlantic washington post new york times hudson review bbc radio you name it he's all over the place how about maybe you know him as the music opera guy he wrote four opera libretti including the one we're going to talk about today nosferatu And his work has been set to music by numerous composers, um, Alva Henderson, Dave Brubeck. Um, Now, I do want to take a special note and say, just for the record, that I wanted particularly to talk about Dana Joya's words for the opera of Nosferatu, the libretto for that. And so we don't end up talking about the opera per se, and uh, which uh, would criminally exclude Alva Henderson. but instead focusing on just the words uh, of Dana Joya's creation. And so 
that's my fault, but that's also my focus and I guess my prerogative. Uh, but I just wanted to clear up any possible uh, misconception that might arise from that. So not so much the opera as much as the words. Uh, let's say you might know him as a champion of the arts nationwide. That could be true because he was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts for three years. The first poet to ever be so, by the way. And he was instrumental in creating and launching all sorts of national arts and literature programs, including Poetry Out Loud, including The Big Read, Shakespeare in American Communities, even Operation Homecoming, Writing the Wartime Experience. Um, awards, American Book Award, Poets Prize, Presidential Citizens Medal, Aiken Taylor Award in Modern Poetry, Walt Whitman Champion of Literary Prize, 10 honorary doctorates. Um, oh God, the list goes on and on. You know what? Before he even got into writing, he was vice president at General Foods. And the rumor is he's the guy who saved Jell-O. <laughs> And it was on its way out, and he brought it back. So if you enjoy Jell-O or even Kool-Aid, I think you have him to thank for it. Um, among his other friends and mentors, Elizabeth Bishop, other people who's had run-ins with John Cheever, um, he became a very dear friend of Ray Bradbury. And in fact, I didn't even begin to get into all the awesome stuff I want to talk with him about because there was so much to talk about. We end up kind of deciding that we're going to do a part two at a later date to pick up on all the very cool things, his poetry, his other works, his stories behind the scenes, um, his thoughts on monsters in literature and in the literary world and on the stage and in poems. But today, our primary focus ends up being, well, the monsters in literature, but also this uh, a brilliant uh, rendition that he does of the Nosferatu story for the stage four opera. I really enjoyed it. I think you're going to as well. So here we go with Dana Joya. Well, Dana Joya, it's an honor to have you here today on The Monster Professor. Glad to be here. Um, it's, you know, we've, we've been talking for a while now and, you know, I've been, I've been hoping to get you on the show for at least a year. And, and a weird thing, if I'm recalling how it all started is I think I reached out to you, um, about one of your many, many books that you put together, a literature textbook that I've been using for at least a decade in my college classes. And I think I was getting huffy <laughs> about uh, a Yeats poem, Lita and the Swan, not being in, a, in an up-to-date edition or the most recent version. And then you had kind of uh, calmed me down by saying, Josh, <laughs> you know how hard we have to fight just to keep Kafka in books, right? I can't win everything. And we got to talking more and more. I had known you as an editor, as, as an arts uh, champion, and as a poet. And um, little did I know there's this whole monstrous side to Dana Joya. I, I got to talking about uh, the podcast and maybe having you on. Like, do you really get into, do you get into the darker monsters? And you're like, oh, Josh, do you not know? <laughs> and then you started turning me on to, there's this whole other side of you. And so maybe we can get going with a little bit of background. Where did this monstrous Dana come from? Well, you know, some might claim that I was born a monster. <laughs> uh, I am a working class Latin kid from Los Angeles. Um, I was born in LA, dab smack in the middle of the 20th century on Christmas Eve, 1950. And so I was raised largely among immigrants in a kind of rough neighborhood of LA, which was the center of the entertainment industry as it still is. And, and so I grew up, I think, in a 21st century situation. Now in the 20th century, there was a strong notion of keeping the popular arts and the high arts separate. 
you know, they were two different things. There was entertainment and then there was serious stuff. I think my generation was probably the first one where you really could not make that division any longer. But if when you went to the university, they still tried to enforce it. But uh, my early formative experiences as a writer were reading fairy tales, mythology, horror stories, science fiction stories, fantasy stories. I mean, my first great literary love affair was with Edgar Rice Burroughs. I read At the Earth's Core and I was smitten. And I, my friends and I probably read 40 of his novels. Uh, this was an era uh, when little boys still read because you know we didn't have the ability to explore all our fantasies on television, movies, the internet, the way you do nowadays. There was a little bit of entertainment, but most of what we would get would come from books and magazines. So I grew up there, you know, uh, reading these things. And, you know, then I discovered Ray Bradbury, Richard Matheson, Charles, you know, Beaumont, H.P. Lovecraft. These books actually were often hard to get. Lovecraft was pretty much out of print, but we could find uh, books in public libraries or find individual stories. So I created myself as a reader through science fiction, fantasy, horror, legend, myth, and fable. Now, this is unusual, I believe, for somebody who went on to Harvard Graduate School in comparative literature. But I think um, that my own formation was the formation that most people had through most of history. You uh, came to, uh, if I would rephrase it differently, I came to storytelling. I came to stories, uh, you know, through these traditional um, modes. And we should talk about the modes of fiction at some point. Yeah, yeah, because you, I think you, I've read at least one interview with you in which you, you lay out kind of these eras of fiction quite well. And, and they seem to kind of, I don't know, mirror maybe a little bit of your experience, like you start off in a kind of mythic or perhaps romantic uh, reader as, as a child, you're, and then you move on into perhaps a more literary, um, at, you know, more literary life um, as, as perhaps our history has gone. Um, but, you know, I, you know, I'm kind of curious about if I could throw one more wrench in the system <laughs> about that. Like you, you, you had this odd upbringing in which you were, you had these working class parents, right, that, that weren't necessarily literary or, or artsy folks. And yet you had kind of a, a, a you know, a classical library around it, where you lived. And yet you go for these pulp writers as well. So you have all these, all these different kind of juxtapositions of influences. So I wonder if we could just dig into all of those and so they could make sense out of it for well, us. You know, I'll explain, you know, the, what you're alluding to. I was raised in a stucco apartment in a, on a block of apartments, uh, you know, facing garbage cans and the backs of businesses yeah. in a town called Hawthorne, which some people will know because it's the town that the on the, uh, the Beach Boys are from. And so it was a very urban, um, grubby childhood. My parents were not, you know, they were working class people. They did, did not have much education, but my Mexican uncle was a, a, had been a kind of proletariat intellectual. He graduated, he was so smart, he kept getting set ahead in his classes. So he graduated high school at 15, but he's a poor Mexican kid in LA in the depression. And so what, what are you gonna do? Uh, he wasn't gonna go to college. So he lied about his age and he became a merchant Marine. So he would essentially educated himself on these ships. You know, he would bring boxes of books and he was killed when I was a little boy. He was, he was killed in a plane crash. But I grew up in, a, in an apartment that was full of books in five languages, music, uh, musical scores. And by musical scores, I mean bound, hundreds of bound volumes of scores of Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, Brahms. And so my parents kept these, not because they 
wanted to read them, but as a kind of act of family piety, you know, they admired his in, this fellow's intelligence, even though they didn't share his interests. So they kept them around. And so I had my uncle's books around me growing up. And I, I would look at some of them, but you know, they, they weren't, you know, when you're 11, you don't really want to read the novels of Thomas Mann or the theater crit criticism of George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> so, but what they were there as, and I realized this in retrospect, as they reminder that said to me, hey, Dana, you're poor, but you're not stupid. Uh, you can do whatever you put your mind to. Now, real education, and I see this is why I think your show, uh, though you probably think of it as a humble amateur production, I think you use the word amateur production. Yeah, very much so. Show began, <laughs> is extremely important because you are uh, focusing on something that is fundamental, I, I believe, to readers, to people who love literature, and that they are guided by pleasure. Now, you know, when I was talking about my own childhood, my own formation as a reader, by the time I got to high school, I was a tremendous reader, but I read, you know, fantasy and science fiction. And then I met uh, a fellow who it, to this day is my best friend, a guy named Jim Laffin. He's a, a small town lawyer in New Hampshire now. But Jim was a literary reader. He, you know, at 14, 15, he was reading John Updike, uh, Saul Bellow, mm -hmm. and people like this. And the two of us began talking and uh, he got me reading, quote unquote, serious books. Now, I had read some serious books, books like uh, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984. I read them because they were serious novelists who had experimented in a sci-fi or a fantasy mode. And I made that a bridge. Ray Bradbury in, in another way was a kind of bridge because Bradbury uh, was a very literary writer who happened to write in fantasy and sci-fi, at least his early works. Yeah. And so that was my bridge. And then I became reading John Cheever, Borges, Thomas Pynchon, Vladimir, Vladimir Nabokov. And by the time I was out of, you know, out of high school, I was, a, I was deeply read in literature. Now, I say that kind of odd, but I am a compulsive reader. Even in my, at the age of 70, I read, in addition to all the poetry, all the nonfiction I read, I read about 40 or 50 novels a year. Uh, I, there's very few people my age that still do that, but I'm a kind of an old, I'm a 20th century person in that respect, not a 21st century person. So anyway, I then came to, to Stanford to be, eventually to be an English major. I started off in music, but I ended up in English, English and German. And it was a given at Stanford that the kind of stuff that I'd written wasn't serious. It was kid stuff. It was you know, it was trash, that literature was the realist mode. Uh, so you, you know, the great writers were Henry James, James, you know, what yeah. F.R. Levis called the great tradition, which was Jane Austen, George Eliot, Henry James, uh, Virginia Woolf, you know, and maybe one novel by Dickens was allowed to enter in hard times, Levis said was, <laughs> could be, tolerated in this great tradition. And, but that was still very much uh, enacted uh, in the teaching that I got there, as was indeed new criticism, which is textual analysis uh, as detached from a study of the author's life. So this, this leads me to, I think, one of the most important things I want to say on this show. This should be uh, news to no one, but it's actually news to many people. There are three basic modes of storytelling in the human race. Uh, this is something that I sort of vaguely knew, but at Harvard, there was a visiting uh, lecturer named uh, Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry was one of the most famous critics in the world 
You got um, to meet Northrop Fry as well. Oh, yeah, and, and, and Northrop Fry was the Canadian, and he, he gave the Norton lectures. You know, not yeah. the Northrop. You know, uh, you know. Uh, that are extras for the Norton lectures at Harvard. And he began yeah. talking about the modes of literature. I began reading him and he was the most illuminating teacher I, I'd ever had. And, and, and it's very simple. And once you start thinking of fiction in this way or storytelling in this way, it's so clarifying. The, the most primitive, the most primal form of storytelling is myth. It's where you, you explain things through the sun becomes a person, you know, the weather becomes a person and they enact their dramas. You know, if, if Thor is mad at somebody, that's why you have lightning and thunder. If Jupiter is fighting somebody, you have, th you know, you have your sky gods, you have your underworld gods, et cetera, et cetera. And, and you know, it, it doesn't have to be consistent. It just has to be vivid and, and memorable. Now, this, you, as storytelling becomes more sophisticated, uh, you have in prose romance emerge. Now, you have the beginnings of realist fiction, which I'll talk about later, that come out in tragedy. You know, Sophocles and people like that are essentially the, the forebearers of Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forrester. But you have romance, and, and romance is described very easily. And this is what we're talking about mostly with science fiction, uh, with, with uh, horror fiction, with you know, sort of romance in terms of you know, the bare-chested Fabio clutching the breathless young lady. And what romance is, is storytelling in which we describe the world as we desire it or we fear it. So in a romance, the heroes uh, undergo incredible dangers, but they survive. The, the lovers have impossible obstacles separating them, yet they come together. I mean, you know, you think of, of Raiders of the Lost Ark as an embodiment of pure romance. You know, this, this sophisticated, handsome hero that, you know, 28 people can shoot at, but not a bullet lands on him. <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and we love this. Romance has been, and it will always be the most popular form of storytelling. That's what Hollywood is about. Now, romance, once again, doesn't mean, you know, hugs and kisses, sex. It means... Uh, that we get the word because it's stories the way the Romans told them. <laughs> you know, that's how the, <laughs> the word comes in. Uh, you know, the story, these, these legendary stories. Now, my formation, as most people's formation, was from romance. Uh, the stories that I desired to hear, the stories that I were, were afraid to hear, you know, the stories that represented, as it were, the the deepest urges of my, uh, my inner life and my dreams. Now, I pursued them with love, you know, with passion, with pleasure. There are a lot of people teaching who didn't read much, but basically are good students. They read the books that were assigned in school. And so their formation is from the third mode. The third mode is realism. And you have to admit that realism is one of the triumphs of Western civilization. It doesn't exist in every culture. And realism is a way of telling a story uh, which is uh, double-sided, which is ironic in some ways. You tell the story and the story is about how uh, Josh perceives his world and how the outer world perceives Josh. Uh, and so you have, you know, and, and realism's beginning, you can say, is that Don Quixote. Don Quixote thinks he's a figure of romance. You know, he's this hero. He's going to fight giants. He's going to court beautiful women. But the world sees uh, Don Quixote as he really is, a kind of pathetic, deluded old man who tilts at windmills and courts prostitutes as if they are, you know, uh, great aristocratic ladies. And so the story proceeds where everything, as it were, happens simultaneously in two ways, how it happens in Don Quixote's mind and how it really happens as perceived by the outer world. And so, and that be, creates a fantastically rich form of storytelling that becomes the novel, uh, you know, in which the, we look at a character and we see both their interior reality and their exterior reality. Now, a Marxist might make it a economic exterior reality, a, 
you know, a, uh, a psychologist might make it the way that their inner uh, psychoses are acted out in the sociological world. But it's a fantastically sophisticated type of imaginative project, but it's an elite form in some ways. It takes, it takes coaching, it takes uh, an ability to decode these texts. So I move between the two of them. And what I have tried to do as a poet is to create stories in a funny way that are rooted in romance, uh, but have that psychological complexity that realism brings. Um, yeah. You see that in, in the ghost stories of Henry James or the ghost stories of Edith Wharton. Uh, you know, whereas in the romance mode, when you have a great writer, Edgar Allan Poe or a H.P. Lovecraft, you know, what their greatness is not so much about creating any sense of outer reality. I mean, the outer reality of H.P. Lovecraft is the same in every story. You will not believe, you know, I found this, you know, this uh, notebook in the ruins of an old manor house destroyed in the most mysterious fashion. I read it with increasing horror. And I will sh uh, show it to you now, uh, dear readers, with no explanations as to its validity. I mean, you know, they give some <laughs> preposterous uh, you know, frame of reality, but then you just jump into people's darkest fears. Uh, and what makes them great is, is the psychological depth and the stylistic splendor. And, it, and certainly in the case of Poe, the unity of effect, you know, which he brings essentially to Western literature and transforms the history of the short story. So I hope I haven't talked too much, but I'm, you know, I'm a little, uh, a little intellectual academic about these things, but I think all I'm saying is this, there are different ways of telling stories and two of them have tremendous vitality in our culture. You know, one of them is romance and the other is realist fiction. And any teacher of literature, any literary critic, which doesn't, uh, who doesn't acknowledge and enjoy both of those, I think is diminished. Yeah, and and I and you laid out a, a beautiful and, and I think elegant explanation of those modes, and that might help make a little bit more sense to to any of my listeners who, or or anybody at any of my events who heard me apologize for calling my novel a novel when in fact it is a romance, and I was cringing when I went ahead and and called it a novel officially <laughs> because you know I would give the very wrong impression uh, of my dark kind of gothic action adventure uh, horror book uh, to call it a romance and people expect a love story when in fact there is none whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. romance, the term romance has been co-opted by a commercial genre. Now, let, let me make one other definition is we have this word genre that people I think confuse with form and they confuse with mode, but there's a mode of storytelling called romance, which is about stories which project your desires, your dreams, and acknowledge your fears. Uh, and that mode of storytelling uh, has created a series of genres. A genre is a kind of mode that uh, has, a, has a kind of conventional subject matter. So under romance, you have horror fiction, you have erotic romantic fiction you in some ways you have pornography i mean you know uh, yeah. although i think pornography is no longer a, ri a literary category it's a category of the of, of the internet uh, you have science fiction uh, you have old style detective fiction where you know i have found a body on the floor of the drawing room <laughs> one of you seven people have done it. you know that's you know these kind of yeah. you know that project the fear of crime but give you all of your fantasies of, of reasonable order, you know, being, being restored. And these are all uh, genres of romance, but commercially you can only call one of them a romance. And I think even if you called it romantic horror uh, or romantic science, people would think you're talking about an, an erotic element. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't mean by erotic, I don't mean, I don't mean <laughs> pornographic. I mean, something about sexual love and sexual passion. Uh, so anyway, um, but I think we that we need to, rec to clarify and reclaim these these uh, these terms, and I believe that in a in a weird way, um, 
the popularity of my own poetry really comes from two or three things. One of the, uh, it, you know, one of the things is that I believe in the music of poetry. I am famous or infamous in American poetry. You know, you can choose your own term for <laughs> helping revive rhyme, meter, and storytelling. You know, because I think that these are the oral modes of, of, uh, of poetry. Secondly, my imagination is very much rooted in romance and myth. Uh, my mythic imagination is Catholic. I mean, it's very sacramental. It's about, you know, in a sense, the, the mythos, you know, which, you know, to a Catholic is the true myth, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of kind of eternal order. But it has that. And I think people, when they read my poetry, it doesn't st strike them as coming from an English department. Uh, it may strike them as coming from a madman, you know, but, you know, but it's not, <laughs> it's not academic poetry. But the third thing is I have a, you know, my poetry is, has a very high polish. I mean, it is very literary poetry. I mean, I'll take a poem and I'll revise it 50 times to get it just right. So I'm working, I think, in poetry's great tradition, but my, the rootstock that nourishes me is very different from the, uh, that which animates or fails to animate academic poetry. Let me read one yeah. poem. Because I know, I think you want to talk at some point about this opera libretto that I wrote called yeah. Nosferatu. <laughs> yeah, that's where there, there's a there's a lot I would love to to unpack there, and and I definitely want to make a segue into your own work because I think you, you know, you you straddle you straddle those worlds of the literary realism and you know that romantic and the dark beautifully I, I think you know you bring up henry james or even borges and i and i think that's the mode you're in those people who can do both wonderfully and and i definitely want to talk about your nosferatu uh, libretto which absolutely blew my mind and in fact at some point perhaps after you read a little bit i want to explain why i think you fixed the Dracula story <laughs> after how many countless renditions we've seen uh, on film or or in other books I think you have fixed it structurally uh better than anyone else I've ever seen um and at some point maybe later on in the conversation I do want to circle back around to some of these writers you bring up that you've you've had a chance to not only meet, but kind of befriend, uh, will very much befriend some of these heroes you grow up reading, such as Ray Bradbury or encountering the handwritten works of Edgar Allan Poe. And and perhaps we could better put that on the back burner for now. Well, no, I, 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 you know, we, you know, we have time enough and not enough time to quote, <laughs> to quote a poem uh, by John Betjeman. But the reason I wanted to read a poem here is because People hear me talking, they, what the hell is this guy talking about? I think it helps to anchor it yeah. uh, in, and, and this is Dracula's love song or Nosferatu's love song. When I wrote Nosferatu, um, I wrote it as an opera libretto, but I also wrote it as a, as a dramatic poem, a poem that you could sit down and you could read all the way through um, as a, a poetic retelling of the the Dracula story. And we can talk about what I did, but this is the voice of the vampire. Uh, now, if you remember the story, the woman has to come to him willingly. And so the, you know, the question, you know, I think is, is uh, arises that what would motivate someone to come to a vampire? You know, this is not a, a, uh, a relationship that generally ends well. And even if you don't know where it's going, the person has to understand that what Dracula represents is the energy of evil. And we can talk about what evil is in this. And so I was trying to, to understand the, not only the psychology of the vampire, which is in some ways simple, but the psychology of the woman who chooses to be his victim or his accomplice. And this is what I came up with. So he's singing to her. I am the image that darkens your glass, the shadow that falls 
wherever you pass. I am the dream you cannot forget, the face you remember without having met. I am the truth that must not be spoken, the midnight vow that cannot be broken. I am the bell that tolls out the hours. I am the fire that warms and devours. I am the hunger that you have denied, the ache of desire piercing your side. I am the sin you have never confessed, the forbidden hand caressing your breast. You've heard me inside you, speak in your dreams, sigh in the ocean, whisper in streams. I am the future you crave and you fear. You know what I bring. Now, I am here. <laughs> that was fantastic. <laughs> that was wonderful. Oh, what a great reading. So, well, you know, what you're trying to do in poetry is to create a spell. I mean, what poetry is, is, is the form of enchantment, which is why it is so fundamental to the romantic mode. And so you, and so you create, try to create a spell, and that spell is a mild hypnotic spell which allows the listener to sort of relax and bring his or her own fears uh, dreams, desires into the experience. And if the poem works, Josh, the poem be becomes as much yours as it becomes mine because your desires are somewhat different from mine. Your fears are somewhat different from mine. And what it becomes is a vehicle of both illumination of the outer world, but also illumination of your personal inner world. And that is what I try to do in my poems. Now, I have to say that I don't think most people do this. Most people nowadays are essentially preaching at you in verse, believe this, don't believe this, be this, don't be that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I can get that in Sunday school. I mean, why do I go to poetry? So, <laughs> and so what I, when I was writing about Nosferatu, I realized, and I think the, the, you know anybody who heard the poem has already figured this out, why does she go to him? What argument does he make? And he makes an argument that I think happens every day in America. And, and, what, I, and what it is is this. Now, there's somebody listening here that this is going to be probably the argument for. You've been different from everybody else around you your whole life. You have a kind of loneliness uh, because you're in touch with the kind of darkness inside of you that other people don't really want to acknowledge. And that has been a burden on you your whole life. But now, if you come with me, you can embrace this darkness that you felt that seems to be a curse and understand that, no, this is the power of your own identity. Come to me to be yourself. Yeah, I think you just got a whole bunch of uh, people sign up for your cult. I think I'm one yeah. of them. Let's, yeah, so let's no, so no, no. <laughs> you know, dear, dear reader, as the Victorian said, dear listener, you have to understand that that's a dangerous argument. But, it's, yes. but I think it's an argument that, a lot, that is responsible for a lot of things in our society, which is that, you know, you're, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a wonderful horror novel of the 19th century called, uh, the confessions of a justified sinner as told by himself. And it's about, you know, a guy who, who is, he's a, he's a uh, believes in predestination and essentially a fellow who's the devil comes to him and says, well, you know, you are saved. No matter what you do, you're still saved. So this guy figures, well, as long as I'm saved, as long as I'm justified, I can do anything I want. So he becomes this, you know, this violent warlord, this raper and seducer of women, you know, and but you know, by the end of the novel, uh, you realize that he really is not justified. <laughs> you know, he's going. <laughs> the devil has got him. You know, firmly in his grip. And so I'm, I'm really interested. And I, you know, I know this is it's very Catholic, but I don't think you have to be a Catholic to believe this. I'm interested in sin, in damnation, in redemption. I'm, I'm fascinated 
by the power of evil. Now we live in a kind of society, you know, which is very positivistic. And, and, and if you take it to the kernel of, of a lot of, of uh, social philosophy, it, it sums up to this is that, you know, everybody is good and you know, everybody will do the right thing if they only are educated, you know, if they're evil, you know, we'll give Mr. Hitler you know, a class in sensitivity, we'll give him a class in, <laughs> in social justice, and Adolf is going to turn out just fine. No, he won't! <laughs> you know, uh, Stalin, Hitler, you know, Richard Speck and other serial killers, they understand that being evil gives you a certain exhilarating power, that there's no high quite like being evil because you're in a world where a lot of people are trying to be good. They're trying to be fair and you can pick them off as Hitler did nation by nation uh, by simply being, uh, by embracing the dark side as it were, embracing the power of evil. So what Nosferatu is about is about the power of evil coming into the lives of a few people uh, who are plagued by psychological problems, by economic problems, by problems of identity, and uh, the near triumph of this darkness. And so I think what people like about it is, I think it's really well written. I mean, I think people like the poetry, uh, you know, that it, that it is, you know, that is created, but they like it because I, I am absolutely fair to the original story. I don't cheat the original story at all. I give you the classic Dracula story, uh, you know, as as filtered through Murnau's Nosferatu, uh, but I suddenly add a psychological, a mythic, a religious, uh, an economic uh, depth to it, which are consistent. Because a lot of times when you do this, you'll see them tell the story, let's say they want to do the economic thing about it, you know, kind of a Marxist vampire, that overwhelms the story itself. You know, I never cheat the story itself. I give you the 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 horror and the thrills of it. You know, uh, you know the yeah. and and I you know and I also recognize something about about the about the vampire. The vampire is a fundamentally European uh, myth, and the myth is really of the aristocracy, as it were, bleeding the peasantry to death. And, and, I, and I realized that had to be in the back. That's why it's always Count Dracula. It's never, hi, I'm Mr. Dracula, <laughs> yeah. uh, self-made man from Peoria. You know, that doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, you can have a vampire that way. But if you want, you want the basic myth, it's, it's, a, it's a figure of power, of ancestry, of place, who becomes the locus of evil. And I, you know, I have these, a couple of lines that were actually uh, printed on the back cover. It wasn't my choice, but my publisher liked it, where he goes... I am the past that feeds upon the present. I am the darkness the daylight denies. I am the sins that you must inherit, the final truth in a world of lies. And so, you know, and so I, you know, that's what, you know, that emblematic nature, but I'm really very, quite proud of this. And I, I consider Nosferatu, because usually people say, and, and I have to say that even, Musical people say, well, you know, an opera libretto, it can be trashy. Just give words for the composer to set the music, the powers in the music. I don't believe that. I mean, <laughs> an opera should be at least as well written, you know, as a bad musical, for God's sakes. But, you know, opera began as a poetic, mythic medium. And so I've tried to bring the opera itself back to this. Uh, and I had a couple other composers that wanted to set new versions of it, but no, I did it with Alva Henderson, and I, and he's my was my partner in this thing, so you know uh, he has the uh, the rights to it. But but the book is, but you know anybody who gets it, it is something you can read cover to cover. Yeah, and and if people are listening, like, well, where can I find that to read? I, a Gray Wolf Press put out, you know, a wonderful copy of this just to read as text, and and I think you really do, you know, of, of the, you know, you you use Nosferatu as a perfect, well, you don't use it, but it is an image of how well you bring this. The, 
tradition of narrative and storytelling back into the world of, of verse. It's no longer just the domain of prose. And then, but you also let it have that music just to finish off, you know, that, that moment that you just recently read uh, where Nosferatu says, I am the name that cannot be said. I am eternal and living undead. And it's just this beautiful kind of, oh, lullaby that lulls you into to getting him but you also give him motivation i think some you know some of the weakness i love dracula by the way i don't i don't want to i don't want to hate on any on any actually i i think i love every version of dracula in its own way um but there are aspects of the original and many other versions that are just kind of arbitrary like why mina why jonathan why does it happen to them it's kind of arbitrary yeah. And, you know, why is Dracula wanting to move to London? Just because he's going to take over the world. I don't know. <laughs> but you, like, you make Orlock, you know, the Dracula character. He, he's, he's running from these memories that won't go away. He's, he's leaving a dead land behind. He wants to kind of be reborn. And then he finally sees another odd creature like himself and that Mina Ellen character and and it's you know it's the Jonathan Eric character's fault that all this happens there's that implication that you know he knows he's kind of cheating this old aristocrat out of his money he's kind of you know doing his wife wrong and hopes for or money to to do right by her. He's he's making a soul selling deal, and it turns up, of course, bad for him. And then then the Mina Ellen character gets to be a real hero, but not in that kind of way where we do in the Marvel movies now, like a like oh, a way to show strong women is just uh, to cast women in the roles of these very masculine, violent acts. Like it's it's a very it's a it's a truly fully feminine hero in which she can kind of use that that light and that embrace to bring down the darkness. Uh, it, it's just it's just beautifully elegant. Well, in you know that this. Way. The, it's interesting you mentioned this because it was understanding Ellen, you know, understanding the you know the kind of female figure. I'm using the name Ellen because that's the name that Murnau used in the original version. But here's the here's my particular reading of the genealogy of the vampire uh, in in literature. You know, Dr. Polidori writes it, you know, when he's, you know, spending this winter with Mary Shelley, Percy Shelley, and Lord Byron. I mean, it's one of the, the great matrices of, of European literature. The four of them get together. Mary uh, Shelley writes Frankenstein. Uh, Polidori ba uh, bases the, his, uh, you, know, you know, basically his vampire story on uh, parts of Byron's poems and Byron, you know, has them. And then Shelley and Byron, who are the two more famous ones, write works that are largely forgotten. Polidori never finishes uh, his vampire story. So it's, it floats around uh, English literature. Then this Irishman named Abraham Stoker, uh, you know, takes it and he does this, this wonderful version of it, but it is largely a kind of Gothic adventure novel. You know, and you know you and you you know when you read it, it's an exciting book, you know. But it's you know you can see how it could a century later be turned into fearless vampire killers. Yeah, because it's about you know it's about these fearless vampire killers that are fighting Dracula. Now, what was the original story that Polidori has? Here's what I think the subtext is: you have these pure English girls who find themselves attracted to these evil dark foreigners. Uh, you know, Polidori, if you think about that, that's an Italian Anglo name. And so, and so it's about the curious destructive attraction that proper British girls feel for sinister foreigners uh, <laughs> and the terrible diseases, sexual diseases that these foreigners bring as if the British aren't, you know, ridden with syphilis themselves. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's the kind of the male subtext that's going on there, not subtext, sort of, of unconscious uh, myth-making that's going on there. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, Stoker, you know, basically creates this thing where, you know, the, the, the virile Englishmen, uh, even if some of them have, uh, you know, non-English names, fight those evil foreign vampires and, pri- and they triumph. Uh, and it's a great, you know, and that becomes, you know, it takes Polidori's fragment and turns it into, you know, one of these uh, generative texts. F.W. Murnau is a tortured, brilliant, um, gay uh, German silent filmmaker. And he's steeped in Wagner. He's steeped in German romanticism. And he wants to film Dracula, but he can't get the rights. So what does he do? He steals. (laughs) (laughs) So he uh, rewrites... uh, you know, since he can't use the rights, he takes the basic premise of Dracula and he rewrites it in his, uh, and most people have not seen the original version of the film, which is very long. He rewrites it as a Wagnerian redemptive tragedy. Um, and it becomes, you know, uh, it goes from this British thing into this kind of very Germanic romantic mode, you know, of, you know, kind of mythic struggle ending in redemption th- through death. You know, in, a, in Wagner, you know, anybody who's worth their salt is dead, you know, by the end of the opera, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, you know. And so then that movie is considered too, too long. So it's cut down into a commercial version that's much closer to Dracula. Uh, now, the other thing that's interesting is Murnau wrote the screenplay to Nosferatu, which, and, you know, there's that wonderful film called The Shadow of the Vampire, you know, uh, you know, which is yeah. about Murnau filming Nosferatu. He wrote his, his screenplay in verse. So he understands, he's bringing it, Bram Stoker, one step back, you know, from, you know, from the romantic, the romantic mode of the adventure story, you know, the, uh, the supernatural adventure story into the romantic mode, you know, of kind of horror. Uh, but horror steeped in in sex and uh, and redemption, you know, because Murnau himself, being gay, you know, understands that there's hidden sexuality in all of these things. Now, the, the reason I wrote this as an opera libretto is that a composer had asked me to write a libretto, and I couldn't figure out. I told him I said it would take me a couple of years to write a libretto, so it had to be something that just struck my imagination. And I happened to meet a film historian who died a few years ago named Gilberto Perez. And he wrote this long piece about the different edits. You know, there's three different versions of Murnos Nosferatu, the last of which actually had musical numbers. It was kind of like a, a you know, a, a Bollywood you know, <laughs> version of the story. I did, you know? I did not know this. That's they, crazy. You know, because they wanted to release it as sound. So they cut all these, you know, whenever they go to the village, the village girls are dancing. Oh, here, you know. Uh, and so... Uh, and I really and, and what you realize is that in the original version, the main character is not the vampire. The main character is the woman, and it's it's about she's tr- and, and, and the situation is she's trapped in a tragic machine from which there is no escape. And I realized that when I was seeing this, that's what a bel canto opera is. You know you. You know, for your listeners, I, your listeners are probably not big opera goers. I'll give them a, a one sentence definition of opera. Opera is musical theater about the suffering of people with high voices. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, a, that's an a, elegant definition, right? There. That's and a, so, you know, and they want, you know, so in the old days you had male castrati, you know, these young promising young boys would have their, you know, their testicles, you know, uh, truncated so that they could maintain their high voices. And they were the crowd pleasers. You know, to this day, you know, we still have men who try to sing in falsetto. You know, you think of the, a lot of the Motown is, you know, you know, Smokey Robinson and people yeah. like this. They cultivated this, you know, this falsetto voice. And so, uh, you know, I real, so I realized that if you had an opera, you don't really want to center it, center it on the bass which is what Nosferatu must be. Uh, you want to, you need to center it on the tenor and the soprano and the, the soprano in bel canto opera, is, you know, is the, is the star, the prima donna. And that's one of the things that gives the female character 
such power in my libretto is that even though the reader doesn't know, know it, from the moment the composer starts reading it, he knows who's going to be the star. You know, it's going to be the battle of the soprano versus the bass. Yeah. Uh, and so, and so you think of, you know, Lucia de Lamamor by Donizetti, this woman is trapped in an unfortunate marriage. And, you know, it's based on, on Walter Scott's novel, The Bride of Lamamor. And she goes mad and she slaughters her husband on their marriage bed. You know, you think of, you know, uh, you know, it, and that's what Bel Canto opera is about. It's about women being trapped by a, usually a male society into horrible things of which their only escape is violence and madness. And, uh, and so that's, I took the energy of that operatic genre and I had it animate the female character. Uh, and the rest of the work really comes out of romantic and horror literature. Yeah, anyway. That, you know, I'm curious, like why, you know, we... Well, you, I want to say one other thing, John. Oh, before, sorry. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. My opera, and this is this is a boast that I, I really can't make on any show in the world except for yours. <laughs> uh, my opera is demonologically correct. <laughs> <laughs> I have my demon. I mean, that's why uh, Nosferatu cannot utter his name. Because for a demon to utter his name gives the listener power over him, power to summon him, power to order him. So uh, the character of Nosferatu cannot give his name, although he understands that uh, he is called Nosferatu by the peasants, which means, you know, the undead one. Uh, yeah, anyway. I, think, I, I picked up on that, actually. I think it's one of those un unspoken, well, until this episode, <laughs> it's one of those unspoken codes among people who perhaps get into the dark and the demonological a little bit too much is then w when you see a, a deep focus on a true name, a secret name, a name that can, cannot be said, you know that that writer knows what he or she is talking about. Yeah, um, and, and, you know, and the thing about it, my advice, once again, to your listeners, if for some reason you find the true name of a demon, don't utter it. <laughs> <laughs> These things do not end well. Now, but see, I believe in, see, I believe in the power of evil. I mean, uh, you don't have to be believe in demons to understand that we live among demons. Yeah. That there are people who decide to live out of the power of evil, out of, you know, and what, you know... Uh, Goethe, you know, when, when Faust asks Mephistopheles who he is, uh, Mephistopheles responds, I am the spirit that denies. And that's where I, it, that's what I'm acknowledging here, which is, you know, uh, I am the darkness, the daylight denies. And, you know, it's, which is to say that evil denies all of those good things of light justice, truth. And there's a darker truth. You know, in mythological systems, uh, and you'll see this so deeply imprinted in Hollywood, although I, probably the screenwriters themselves do not understand it, all mythological systems have two, ser two sets of gods, the gods above and the gods below. You know, Christianity, you know, has you know, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the saints above, but there's a kingdom below ruled by Satan. And so you have this duality, you know, which plays across all cultures, you know, because it's a universal, it's, a, it's an anthropological universal to acknowledge a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, you know, in some mythology, especially Hindu, those darker gods are given uh, almost equal honor and footing, you know, with the, with the sky gods. Yeah. Or so, Norse, uh, stronger. So <laughs> than, yeah. than our, yeah. So anyway, yeah. enough, I mean, but it's, you know, these things are fat. I mean, I mean, one reason that Nosferatu is, I think if it's good, if it is good, and I, that's an author can't say this, it's because I believe in the truth of everything in it. You know, if the yeah. vampire isn't literally true, the vampire is a vehicle for saying things that are so true that we need, because why do we need to, why do we keep reviving the story? It's because that story is a, the vampire story is a vessel of truth that we need uh, in our society because it's, you know, it's, we're trying to pretend it doesn't exist in other ways. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, I guess maybe that, that leads me to, to another question that, you know, you've kind of hinted at, but but I mean, directly, I wonder wonder how you could frame it to somebody who's a bit more skeptical. I mean, you're a champion of, of validating popular art, I think, and you have been throughout your career. You've been a champion of democratizing elite art so that, you know, everybody should have access to it. But in, in many ways, you're also this the champion of of bringing not just popular art, but kind of this this dark and this monstrous and this supernatural in in validating that. And you know, other you know, more of a skeptic could think, yeah, but Dana Joya, why not? If you're interested in evil, why not write this libretto over Jack the Ripper or over Stalin or or some over over somebody who's realistically like why? Why a literal ghost in your fantastic poem well, you, and libretto haunted? Why Nosferatu the supernatural? Well, that's a very good question. And the answer is I could have. Um, I could have written, you know, a libretto about Stalin. I could have written a libretto about Hitler. Uh, I'm not sure you anybody wants to see Stalin or Hitler on stage. <laughs> no, that's uh, true. <laughs> you know, I mean, the death of Stalin was a pretty good movie. And, and yeah. Uh, you know, the, and you know, springtime for Adolf is you know is an interesting you know fictive musical, uh, but several reasons. First of all, the the Dracula story, uh, you know, and to complete the, the things, you've got Nosferatu, you've got these things, but then you have the, the play by Bram Stoker of Dracula, in which a fellow a Hungarian actor named Bela Lugosi makes a sensation, and then you have. Uh, universal film it, I think in 1931, 32, and it becomes a huge, huge hit with Bela Lugosi. So it enters, it enters American popular culture at that point, and it's never gone away. So, so the Dracula story was my own part of my own formation. So that's one reason I wrote about it. I could write about it from the inside. Secondly, there is no great vampire opera. You know, you've got you know, all kinds of other operas. And I said, well, gee, it's just an obvious thing to do as an opera uh, because people know the story. And in, in general, when you go to the opera, you know the story. I mean, you know, if you're going there to see the Valkyrie, well, you know who the Valkyries are. You know, these women with, you know, you know, with their helmets that, you know, pick up great warriors, you know. If you go to see Siegfried, well, you're going to know that Siegfried's going to fight the dragon, you know, and is going to do these things. I mean, so the, the story of an opera t is tends to be a myth or a legend or a historical thing that people know. So I figured it was, it had not been a great vampire. So it's part of my formation. So I can enter it at the deepest levels of my own psyche. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, an obvious uh, gap in the operatic repertory. But the third thing is that what's the trouble about, you know, uh, writing an opera about Hitler? Do you really want to hear Hitler sing for three hours? Uh, is Eva Braun, strong enough to be, you know, a very interesting character, you know, and, you know, you, I, I guess you could have a, do, you know, a trio with Goering, Goebbels, and, you know, <laughs> but it's pretty <laughs> appalling, you know, uh, but the thing here is I, I realized the reason I wanted to do this is I, those first two things were pre-existing conditions, but then I said, this is, I'd never occurred to me that the vampire story is not the story of the vampire, it's the story of the woman that he's courting. And that was the revelation for me, which suddenly it all happened. It all happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, and then I had to, to, to I had to spend a couple of years writing it. So anyway, it's, it's actually, it was, a, it was just a new production of it done about a year ago. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a beautiful, powerful, melodic, dark opera, but it takes tremendous voices to sing. And so it's hard to produce. You, you've got to get, two really great singers, the Nosferatu and the Ellen, then you got to get a pretty damn good singer for the tenor, you know, for Eric, um, you know, and, and so, you know, and it's, it's good. I'll read one more little piece of it. If, uh, yeah. if, you know, if I can, and then, then we'll move on to something else. Maybe you can, we can wrap up this first show with this. Now, if you know anything about operas, if you know anything about tragic operas, what do tragic operas often have? They have a mad song somewhere, you know, uh, in the end of the second act, this, the suffering has been so tremendous for Lucia has been so, you know, uh, you know, tr tremendous, you know, for the hero of La Sonambula that the, the soprano goes crazy. 
and then she has a she enters with you know the in the third act of the fourth that would act or however you want to use it, but usually it's the third act she enters the third act with a mad song the audiences loved it it's one of the great things you know because <laughs> you, because once again it it was a dramatic vehicle that allowed people to understand extremities of suffering so terrible that they broke down people's minds and it also gave them a chance in a sense to understand insanity you know and so i mean i actually believe that you know it also was thrilling i mean there's the cheap thrills as well but it's you know, it has a it has a kind of cultural function but in this one i thought i would give the the tenor a mad song. I think, you know, tenors don't get mad songs. And I thought that would be a wonderful thing to give Eric a mad song. So at this point, you'll know from, you know, the various versions of Dracula that this fellow ends up in a madhouse. Uh, the, but he believes that the madhouse is not a madhouse. He believes that all of his, his, because in the case of my opera, he's been motivated by this desire to make money, to get himself out of poverty. He believes that the madhouse is a mansion that he has and that the staff are his servants. And uh, so he's wheeled in a, you know, in a chair onto the stage and his, he's talking to his wife, you know, who's visiting him. Uh, and uh, he's, you know, he's, he begins to recount his adventures, which he believes has ended up uh, with his wealth and power. I sailed a ship in a storm wracked sea and all were drowned except for me. I swam all night to death-cold waves till my shipmates called from their sunken graves. A lucky life for you, lad. A lucky life for you. I fought through wars in a barren land till none were left of my rugged band. On a field of dead, only I stood free. Then a blind crow laughed from a blasted tree. A lucky life for you, lad, a lucky life for you. I scaled a mountain of cold, sharp stone. The others fell, and I climbed alone. When I reached the top, the winds were wild, but a skull at my feet looked up and smiled. A lucky life for you, lad, a lucky life for you. Now I sit in my mansion with my art and my gold and a dozen servants who do what they're told. But the nights are long and dawn brings no cheer and I wake alone and the paintings all sneer. A lucky life for you, lad. A lucky life for you. So, uh, That's you know, wonderful, we'll, wonderful. So we'll we'll end with Eric in the Madhouse, and 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 I and, and I'd urge people, you know, to look at the book. You can probably pick it up if not. I'm sure it's still available new, but you could probably pick it up for a few dollars on the internet. Nosferatu, uh, and I have the subtitle of it, which I, which I rather like. You know, kind of well, you know, I guess it was taken out of this final version, but it, you know, it's a, sort of a a gothic horror. Uh, there's a wonderful. Uh, introduction by a vampire scholar, and then at the end of the book is another essay about me about writing it. So why don't we end the, your, our first episode here, and then we can move on for, in our second show. Okay, um, that sounds great. Maybe we can um, to make sure that we kind of get this information, and in, you know, listeners wanting to find out more about you, about your works. Um, about what you're up to. Um, the links to, to these will be in the description below on whichever platform you're listening to it on. But where can uh, listeners find out more about Dana Joya and all of his works, all of his many, many, many works and projects going on and still going on? Well, the, the challenge of finding out anything about Dana Joya comes from the ability to correctly spell <laughs> my surname, which is an impossible uh, Italian surname. It's, it's very easy to pronounce. It's Gioia, means joy in Italian. But uh, luckily on this website, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see it in print, but it's G-I-O-I-A. I have a website, which is danajoya.com. And I have a lot of, of uh, videos on it, a lot of articles I've written, um, a lot of poems I've written, has a list of the books, that I've published. So there's a lot of information about that, but you can also Google me and there's, you know, 
gazillion articles. The problem about uh, researching me is that, you know, I've done several things in my life. I was chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts. I was California Poet Laureate. I'm a critic. Uh, for many years, I worked in business and I wrote at night, uh, you know, and I'm a poet. So it's easy to, you know, suddenly you'll find yourself with, you know, 25 articles about, you know, about arts leadership, and that may not be what interests you. But if you go to danajoya.com, it's mostly about my imaginative work. And, um, you know, I think people will find, a, 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 the, you know, some interesting things there. Uh, you know, I've also just had uh, my selected poems published in Spanish. And that's kind of interesting. And it was interesting oh, to cool. see what the uh, the Spanish translator uh, chose to, to translate. And he, he was drawn to my longer uh, narrative poems. I mean, there's a lot of short poems in there, but to my surprise, he did, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, these longer poems. Now here, I should explain something about my work. Um, I'm a poet. And nowadays, you know, if you read a book of poems, you expect most of the poems to be like one page long and they fit kind of nicely on a typographic page. And, you know, maybe the long ones are two pages long, but most of the poems are lyric, you know, they're just, here's what happened to me, or they may be uh, increasingly dog, you know, kind of, of uh, didactic, you know, you must do this, you must not do this, social yeah. justice demands that, political correctness demands that. But uh, my poems are about half lyric, but every book that I published has a long, one or, or more long narrative poems. These are, as it were, short stories or even novellas in uh, the form of verse. And, so, and I think one of the, now what, people could ask a very simple question. Why would you want to tell a story in verse, in poetry? <laughs> uh, and for me, it's an easy question to answer because if I were to take a poem like my poem Haunted and I were to write it in prose, um, I think it would be somewhere between 50 and 100 pages long. And actually, you could make it 300 pages long if you really wanted to develop the characters. Yeah, it's a prose, novel. Uh, I think it's yeah, a whole prose novel. fiction. Yeah, prose fiction tends to require context and realism and social detail and things like that. The advantage of a poem is I could do that. And I honestly believe it is more powerful than it would be in prose. I can do that in a matter of 10. 12 pages. Uh, so a work that would, you know, that would be maybe to be 20 minutes to read aloud, you know, versus take you six, seven days to read uh, as prose. And you do that by having language, which is more intense and more evocative. I can do one or two lines, which su suddenly summon up something rather than, you know, 10, 15 pages. At the moment, I'm reading a wonderful novel. It's a novel by Balzac, uh, who's one of, my, one of my favorite writers. It's Cousin Bet, Cousin Beth. And, you know, and he'll say, you know, he'll spend five pages to tell you how somebody borrows money, how the <laughs> note of credit is taken and then discounted, you know, and he'll have a thing about the dress manufacturers. The, one of the greatest novels ever written, Lost Illusions, has about 40 pages uh, at the front of the novel about the, the economics of the printing industry in Paris in the 1820s. And that works in a novel, it just, you know, but it's not intense. Uh, you know, you, you know, and you can write a poem that doesn't need that. And so that's why, you know, I like that because I like the notion of a poem being, how to, I like the notion of storytelling happening aloud. You know, we're all sitting around the fire, we're sitting around the room and we tell a story. And I think that has a tremendous human energy that is slightly diminished on the page. Now on the page, uh, we do have a perhaps a better sense of someone's inner life, this, the life of silence. But I like the life of, of, of speech shared aloud. 
Yeah, and you've really brought that to life on this episode. I think I think it's going to be a real delight for a lot of listeners to discover not only your your many works if they didn't already know about it, uh, but to, to get to hear this this wonderful voice that you give and this wonderful music that you give to it uh, auditorily. So I th- it's been a real delight uh, for me, and I and I know it's going to be for them too. It's been fun. It's been fun. I hope you've had fun. I've had fun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've I've had a blast. This has been this has been a huge delight for me and you've been so generous with your time and and now to to get kind of a rain check promise to, of a second episode in which we get to perhaps focus on haunted, maybe maybe some of your thoughts on Poe and and different things that would just be fantastic. Um and- well, we, we shall do that and I look forward to it. And just let me end by saying I believe that the the area of literary experience that you explore, you honor, uh, you know, you present in your show is so essential to the energy of literature itself. And, and uh, so you're doing something original, bold, and important. So wow. that, that means a lot coming from you, sir. So I very much appreciate it, perhaps more than you can know. Well, you're very welcome, and I look forward to us completing this conversation at a future date. <laughs>